What's up, gang? Welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George, and today we have our final episode of Crowdfunding Countdown for the year. That's it. It's over. Really? That's the end? Yeah, this is the last one. Oh, I'll miss it. It's the truth. Yeah, I hope oh. it's the last time I, I see you a yeah, stinking last... face wise it's guy. It's the last. Okay, no. I'm looking for a no. little smooch at midnight. Yeah. I'd have to throw my. Uh, it's the last one of you, that's what I'm saying. Kickstarter is finally winding down. Can you believe it? Well, actually, I just kind of decided to combine a few weeks together, and then maybe I could take off some time for Christmas. I have some other videos planned, but in terms of crowdfunding, nobody's going to be jumping on board or finishing up their campaign around Christmas time. That just doesn't make any sense. So this is our last one for the year. We'll cover a bunch of stuff, and then, of course, we'll be back in the new year because, hey, it's a good weekly thing to do. But first off, before we get into today's video, I just want to say thank you to all the people who signed up for Patreon already. I launched my Patreon last week, and to those of you who have signed up already, Ashley, Aaron, Kath, Jason, Sean, Mark, Garrett, Copeland, Alan, Scott, and Scott, you are all incredible, except for one of the Scots. And, well, I'm not going to tell you which one, obviously. But you. You're the good one. But seriously, thank you so much for supporting the channel. It's incredible to me that people are willing to support and just, just chipping in a couple bucks every month really can go a long way. And really helps me to, you know, start to take a little bit more time, as if I don't spend a lot of time on this already, on this channel and create hopefully some really fun stuff in the future as well. I have one thing that I'm, I'm almost done. I just need to figure out a place to film it, but I think it's going to be pretty cool. I don't want to hype it up too much. I'm not even going to tell you what it is, but maybe my patrons will get a sneak peek. Anyway, to the rest of you, you're dead to me. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. You absolutely don't have to become a patron. Just, there's no requirement whatsoever. I really appreciate all of you liking and commenting and subscribing and sharing this channel in various places. It's really great. Thanks to all of you for being here. I really mean that. It means a heck of a lot. But I just wanted to take the time and, and emphasize a thank you to the patrons because, yeah, I get it. Throwing, even just throwing a couple bucks to someone a month is a, a significant step. And it, it really, it's very touching to me that, that some of you would consider doing that. So thank you. And so if you happen to want to throw me a couple bucks a month, if you use an ad blocker or something, then next time they ask you at the grocery store, hey, would you like to donate a couple bucks to charity? You can say, nope, sorry, I already spent it on Chris at Room and Board, blame him, and send him my way, and I'll take care of that for you as well. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this pitch every week. But it was the first week, and on that first couple days to see everybody jumping in, it was, yeah, it really just meant a lot. So I, I just wanted to, to make a, a shout out to those people. And thank you to everybody who uh, signs up in the future as well. Because that level of support is more touching than perhaps some of you know. So... Let's get into the games this week. It is a weird week, extended week, <laughs> extended few weeks. We've got a couple of big ones that are still out there and then the rest is just pretty much print and plays and roll and writes, or both. But since I missed a roll and write last time and I felt like a fool when someone mentioned it in the comments and say, oh yeah, you didn't cover this one. I vowed to not let this happen this time. <laughs> And then when we get to Weather Machine, I'll try to do a mini five reasons you shouldn't back just because they are almost at that million dollar threshold and I probably won't end up making a full video on them. So this will serve as your introduction to that game as well. And I'm assuming it'll probably end up being my pick of the week, but uh, only time will tell. And so speaking of big campaigns or roll and writes, the first one is neither of those two things. With Free at Last, a pretty heavy game about the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But hey, don't feel like you missed out on it because it's pretty much still happening today. <laughs> We're getting close, maybe. Yep. Merry Christmas. Our world is still prejudiced and horrible. And here's a reminder. <laughs> what a way to start the week. Now, they don't have a rulebook on their campaign page, but they do have a rulebook on Board Game Geek, and it is a lot to get through. It's almost like it's just devoted to focusing on closet cases right off the bat and not really explaining how the game is played. <laughs> but their campaign page explains it in a little bit better detail and gives you kind of the bare bones, which is great. You're basically going to take on one of the organizations that is a driving force behind the civil rights movement, some of which are known for their non-violent protests like CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, versus some other organizations like the, the violent ones, the, the really violent ones, which also weren't really that violent. Well, certainly not that violent when you compare them to the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> and so based on what organization you are, you're going to have powers and different cards perhaps to 
affect this and to, to kind of affect the game. You're then going to take turns committing various protesters from your hand to various civil rights protests that are ongoing so that you can solve civil rights once and for all. You're doing it. Or you're not because you put too many protesters in one place and sure you got attention there but it also drew the attention of the police and that protest got shut down and didn't actually do anything and maybe did more harm than good. And if too many protests fail, then everybody loses. So it has this sort of semi-co-op nature to it, which is kind of interesting. And I really like this response that they gave to a BGG commenter who said, ah, oh, yeah, I would be in, but I don't really like the co-op thing. Like they wish that it was a fully co-op thing, right? You're solving civil rights. It feels like that would be a co-op game. But the head of the publisher responded that history textbooks often paste over or ignore the rivalries that happen between the various organizations and some of the actions taken that each one took to spite each other. And they actually hired a specific consultant whose PhD is on these specific rivalries between the different organizations. And that consultant was so excited, well, I'm sure to be asked to be involved, but also that that sort of thing was emphasized. So it is a co-op in which you need these protests to succeed to further the greater cause because then everybody loses, but only one organization will come out on top as putting their mark on things, being known for being the major organization in the civil rights movement. And this is pretty fascinating to me. It's kind of a cool thing at play. And I think that they're addressing the theme in a really nice way if you can say nice to talk about these sorts of things, but a really considered way. And even Jim Dietz, who's the publisher, he says he's foregoing all of his own royalties on the project and making that as a donation to a, a different foundation. There's lots of different foundations that are going to be donated as as kind of part of the extra stretch goals as well. So it's great because then it doesn't feel like it's just this person profiting off the backs of a lot of suffering, which is always a good thing in these sorts of things. However, the price is expensive. It's 75 bucks US. This includes shipping to anywhere in the US or it's $88 US to ship internationally. And I like that they've included the shipping price in their cost, but still, even though I think it would be a cool way to learn about various civil rights activists, a subject that I am definitely interested in and feel I should know more about and certainly do not, I don't necessarily have faith that the game itself will be that easy to learn. And if it's not that easy to learn, it's not that easy to pick up, then it makes it a little bit inaccessible and to have something where the subject matter already potentially makes it a bit inaccessible to add on layers and layers on that, you might find it hard to get to the table, which ultimately, as great as a thesis it might be, you need to be able to be getting it to the table as well. It's just little things, like I read through the rule books and was reading all these steps and there were things like, hey, at every odd number turn, you're gonna shuffle this specific deck and then only add cards from turns four to eight from here. And it just seems like there's gonna be a lot to keep track of. And I don't necessarily have the faith there's a good system in place to make that easy for players to do. But a really ambitious and cool project that definitely check out if the subject matter interests you and you want to be supporting something that uh, tackles these sorts of issues. I think that's really cool. So if you're interested in that, that is starting off our week Wednesday at 10 a.m. Now next up we have Basic Coins, which if you want a decently cheap set of metal coins, it gives you 75 coins, 25 of copper, gold, and silver for 25 bucks, which is fairly reasonable considering I usually find metal coins run you around a dollar a coin which I always think is ridiculously expensive to me. Metal coins just have never elevated a game in a way that I feel like they were worthwhile. Even in something like Rising Sun, my favorite game of all time. <laughs> my friend has the metal coins. I do not. I purchased the metal coins in the time machine just so I could match him and stop getting teased that my copy was inferior. But really, I don't think it enhances the gameplay all that much. But these seem pretty solid. The copper ones say they're about the size of a US dollar. The silver ones are about a quarter and the gold ones are about a nickel size. And so you get 25 of each. And of course, gold is the smallest one because that's how you know it's worth more. It's not about size, it's about density. I say that to people on dating apps all the time and yet nobody believes me. It's about weight, value per square millimeter. Now, I generally ask this when talking about the subject of metal coins and that is 
why couldn't you just use your own loose change for everything? Because I don't see how fake money generally costs more than real money. But pennies have since been banned in Canada, so we have no longer access to them. Finally, there's a way to get our copper coins back. So if you are interested in metal coins, this one exists. It's not funding right now, which is strange to me because it seems like a very reasonable option, but maybe people prefer them to be game specific. And these, of course, are just kind of general as well. So if you're interested in that, that is 106 on Wednesday. Now, funding one minute after that, also looking like it's not going to fund, we have a game called Empower Empathy, where you, a brave citizen of Empathropolis, which I just love to say, has to take down the evil villain Gooby who's causing havoc. And there's a few things I like about this campaign. One, it claims that it teaches empathy, which would have been great for me to learn at a young age so I didn't end up like the emotionless husk that I am right now with all of my relationships suffering because of it. Is it too late to learn empathy? Am I too late to visit Empathropolis? Now Gooby's gonna run around turning city blocks red and you have to change them back to their normal color by resolving these city watch cards. Yeah, take that Gooby. But my favorite part about the video that really made me just wanna talk about this game, <laughs> because I may not have covered it since it's probably not gonna reach its funding, but when they're explaining about turning the, the tiles back to their normal color by resolving a city watch card, they draw a card and you just see that it says, Greg has dropped his ice cream. And I know you're supposed to be watching for trouble and help Greg get over the trauma of dropping his ice cream cone, which honestly, I'm still upset about the time I dropped my ice cream cone in 1997, or the time my dog ate all of my birthday donuts. Speaking from personal experience, I don't expect Greg to get over this whatsoever, but it also makes it seem, just from the phrasing of the video, like kind of the reason you were able to turn the space back from red is because Greg dropped his ice cream cone. And th this, this is a game that I, I think I much prefer, where Greg just runs around the city looking for ice cream. Very impressive for someone who looks like they're six. Well, cartoon six, that could be anywhere from six to 24, speaking from personal experience. Anyway, Greg runs around the city and you have to chase him down, intercepting him right at the moment he got his ice cream and knocking it from his stupid idiot hands. And then he'll cry, oh, he'll cry all right. But those tears aren't enough for you. You want more because the person to bottle 20 of Greg's tears wins the game. But watch out for Greg's mom and dad because they're trying to help their little son Greg get his sweets. Well, maybe you should have bought it for him, mom, instead of letting him run around a deadly city on his own. Oh yeah, it's Sin City. Greg is lost in Sin City. And the only way for you to get out of Sin City is to trade his tears to a very questionable smuggler who promises to get you out of the city before the government wipes it off the face of the map. And who knows what he's going to do with those tears, but I don't want to think about it. And maybe you should just tell Greg that. Maybe the two of you could work together to get out of this hellhole. Or maybe that's why you don't deserve ice cream, Greg. You can eat it on the outside. Or maybe this, this is just, this is why I need to learn empathy. Anyway, it's $86 Canadian or $68 US. And this is probably one of the reasons it's not funny because that's very expensive. But I definitely look forward to backing 100%. Go get Greg's sloppy little tears coming to Kickstarter in January, 2023. So keep your eyes peeled. Anyway, that's Wednesday at 1.07 p.m. <laughs> now our third one this week, and yes, it, 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 I'm sure it's only the third one. I just, I blacked out there for a second. I was in a fugue state. Walter White is a good father. Greg's father. Getting him lots of a lot. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> this, this blackout thing keeps, keeps happening. <laughs> Maybe I should go get that checked out. But next we have Nahuali, which for 165 US dollars, you can get yourself a handcrafted hexagon filled with smaller handcrafted hexagons. Wait, no, that's the early bird. For 200 US dollars, you can get yourself a handcrafted big old hexagon filled with smaller hexagons. I mean, the early bird, to put it into perspective, is the same price as Iridia. But 39 people have banded together to make this thing a reality. And sure, it's just a fine game. You have actions, you can add to the board and you could reshape the board moving this 3D terrain around as you try to target your other players and hit up with sticks or whatever weapons you have. But there's no world in which I take this seriously. And I try to be choosy about the ones that I talk about. I just cut a game that was called the Game of Terrets. You know, the orange vegetables. That's not a good joke, Chris. <laughs> That's why you cut it. Anyway, this is this is obviously not for me. I'm surprised, I would be incredibly surprised if it was for any of the 3,000 of you, which is still cool to say. But this does go to show you that either this person has a lot of family members 
whom they owe a great debt to, or it remains as a beacon of the small little microcosms of communities that can come together and make a thing into existence. And you know, I think that's pretty cool. So I hope for those people, they're really happy. They love this beautiful piece. I'm sure it's gonna be gorgeous, right? Handcrafted wood, who doesn't love to play with that sort of stuff? I hope they have a great time. Maybe I've found empathy after all. Oh no, the cynicism is creeping in. It's probably just this one person making them all himself anyway. You actually didn't need such a large order number. Oh no, let's move on before Gooby consumes us all. But if you're interested in jumping on board for that, that's Wednesday at 4.56 p.m. Now, moving along, remember how a couple weeks ago we set out on an epic quest to find the perfect drinking game. Well, perhaps it's this, Gather Your Party, which is a game about drinking but involves no drinking. Could this be the perfect drinking game? I don't think it is, but we'll see. <laughs> it's a card game where you want to complete four quests, and if you do, you win, but it takes place at a fantasy bar. So if you get four drinks, you're knocked out. Sounds like every time I drink, I'm a lightweight. Four skinny apple teenies and I'm flat out for the night. Anyway, it's very simple. You draw a card or you play cards from an existing hand and you're playing patrons. You have to play a certain number of patrons to complete a quest, you get that quest. You get four, you win. But you're also going to be playing cards which will give other people drinks or have some zany effects on them. It's not quite a funny card game, but it's uh, in that sort of genre. And it's 25 bucks Canadian. So you know what? The most reasonable offer perhaps that we've seen yet this week. I'm happy it's funding, but again, it kind of feels like every other card game to me. I think, and I was thinking about this beforehand before I started filming, I think the key for me is that whenever you're drawing cards that have potential different abilities from a communal deck, that just feels way too random for me to ever really be that invested or interested in it. You can still have a fun time, sure, but it's not one that I'm gonna to return to every time unless it creates an atmosphere around the table that is enjoyable to return to because of the game. And so, hey, if you think that this Gather Your Party will create that, talking about getting patrons of barbarians and then the barbarians help you do a quest, but they're also your patrons, I'm confused about the theme. And hey, if you wanna support a Torontonian, well, well, I don't know if you heard the five minutes I talked about Patreon at the beginning of the video. <laughs> okay, that's my last one. Anyway, if you're interested in checking that out, that's Thursday morning at 11.01 a.m. Now, moving along, we have Magic Sword Tactics, which is a print and play a solo tower defense print and play, so you know that I'm the most interested in this one. Spoiler alert. But hey, if you like that genre, well then make sure to check it out. It's a very small sort of thing. It's got great music on his video, really got that 8-bit sort of feel to it. And that you are a lone magic sword wielder standing up to the hordes of the Demon King, and you gotta fight back the onslaught as it charges towards you, or moves slowly one card at a time towards you, but they're charging. They're charging. Plus, it does have the perfect tagline at the end of the video. Sometimes you just want to play by yourself. <laughs> anyway, it seems pretty standard. You have these advancing hordes, and in order to take them out, you're going to roll a dice. You're going to compare that number to this magic stick that you used to see how much damage you do. And if you do more damage than their value, you kill them. That's it. That's the gist of it anyway. It's 12 bucks for a print and play or 28 bucks for a physical copy. They both seem a little high for me, but again, I'm not really interested in this genre, but maybe you are, so you may want to check it out. That's 7.04 on Thursday. Now, next up, we have Warlord Chess, which if you ever thought to yourself, dang it, why is chess only a two-player game? This solves that problem. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Now you can fight up to four people in chess. I'd like to explain the rules to you, but if you know how to play chess, then you, you know how to play this. The only difference is there's this little chaos symbol in the middle, where if you're on there, you can attack kind of anybody you want. You can spin your pieces around, go into different quadrants, etc. And then there's also these castles, which are at the four corners of the board, where you start. You start here and your castle's here. And they can help you do extra moves. Basically, you're just gonna sit in them and then you can access multiple places on the board. Or what I thought was really cool is that if you move your bishop to them, you can change the color of your bishop from white to black. I mean, I am intrigued by multiplayer chess. I like chess. It's 50 bucks US, 64 Canadian. And then the shipping makes it a little bit too much for me to realistically consider it. But I do like that they offer you a number of different color combinations. I think that's fun. You can customize your set with the colors that you desire. I mean, if you just went out or you have two chess sets and you just drew the map on a big old piece of paper, 
you could probably have the same experience because the rules are readily accessible and it's, it's just chess. But if you do get it, you get to say my favorite quote from when Ron Weasley used the time turner to go back and see Genghis Khan only to walk in on him on the in the public baths that were oh so around in the time of Genghis Khan, his famous fascination with public baths. But you know, Ron, that's Warlord's chest. <laughs> that's, that's it. In YouTube, you can see how many people watch a certain amount of the video, and that's the moment where it all went down to zero. You do not want to hear where the rest of that fanfic ends up. It is steamy. And that is not just because of the steam of the baths. There's spoiler alert. Anyway, if you are interested in that, that's Thursday at 10 p.m. for Warlord's Chest. <laughs> Chess! <laughs> oh. Speaking of old expressions, gaming is what? Fundamental. I think that's the expression. And in these trying times of shipping prices, Fundamental Games has just decided, meh. You just print it yourself. You want one game? Pfft, too bad, we're gonna give you five of them. What's neat here is that most of these actually already had Kickstarter campaigns, and I'm not sure how they circumvented the no reselling the same things in Kickstarter rule, but here we are with five games of print and play. Usually you have to throw something in there, like a soundtrack and an, an ability to buy the game, etc. I actually do like those soundtracks though, even though, although if my experience with the Command Time Machine is anything to be believed, you can just get them for free even if you don't pay that one dollar. Anyway, no soundtracks here, this is a tangent. We've got all print and plays, and I have a confession to make. I have come to this conclusion about myself. I am too lazy to print out these games. Perhaps in my youth I might have been inclined to a print and play, but even still, I, I'm i too bougie. I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. But I love the idea of it. I love when companies do this, when companies offer an accessible way to get it for people who can't afford the full thing. I absolutely love that. I just, I just know that I'm never going to do it. <laughs> But that being said, if you haven't stopped lying to yourself yet, this is actually a pretty good deal. You get five games. One of them's not really a game. Game's a bit of a stretch. But for 25 bucks, you get five game files, which it's even better when you have the files because then you can print doubles of them. Well, doubles of four of them and have triples of the deck of dice. Okay, okay, triples of Questeros, deck of dice, and then doubles of Legends of Novus, Die in the Dungeon, and Duels of Dragon. Maybe triples of Novus. Anyway, so I'm just gonna briefly touch upon these not do a whole breakdown because we've got Weather Machine up next and thank goodness we do something to save this video <laughs> from going completely off the rails. So first up we have Legends of Novus and this is their largest game by far. You can check out the previous Kickstarter. The base game kind of sold for around the $60 mark and you're getting a one-shot experience of turning your lowly little adventurer into an epic adventurer slaying demons they really describe it as Diablo. That's what they were pitching on their previous campaign page as well. That you're going to be collecting these variable equipment and going through these dungeons and slaying monsters. And I also like that they have on their page that says, Strong visual characters, character boards, images, classes, rewards, and skills, pen and paper, not required. I mean, paper, paper is definitely required because it is the print and play version and they just copied that from their previous <laughs> Kickstarter campaign. Anyway, if you're looking for something that has that sort of Diablo feel, definitely check this one out. Next on their offering is called Die in the Dungeon, which they describe as a reverse dungeon crawler where you're the monster chasing down the baddies. And it kind of reminds me of Keep the Heroes Out, if you remember that as well. I love when Companies say this reverse dungeon crawler, there was the reverse tower defense of the the oil spill one. And it's the same it's the same mechanic. It's just you're taking the other side and still doing the same mechanic. You're just flipping the theme, really. You need to be exploring this dungeon and crawling through this dungeon and finding the various heroes and taking them down. It's a dungeon crawler, but you're the va you're the villain. But if that sounds appealing to you and you want to print it out, great. Next we have Questerost, which is a trick-taking game using a full tarot deck and a fully functional tarot deck too, so you can do a reading before the game to predict who's gonna win, and then if that person doesn't win, then whoever gave you the reading is a fraud and deserves to be ostracized from your group for the rest of eternity. But I don't know, I find tarot decks really fun. I've had one reading back in the day in university where the person doing the reading, they turned up, I think it was the cups, all of the yellow cards, and they were like, wow, I've never seen anybody get this much. You are so happy. Well, look at me now, Nicole. Just look at me now. It's just all death cards. There's only supposed to be one in the deck. I touch the deck, it just instantly turns black. 
<laughs> no need to flip the cards over, it just disintegrates. <laughs> Oh man, I'll never make it back into Empathropolis. Friggin' Greg. Anyway, Questeros, it's screw your neighbor, or stick the dealer, or oh hell, that card game just using a tarot card deck. And hey, that's a great card game, so this, I'm sure, would be fun. But you can also just play it with a regular deck of cards, so eh. Not sure if you really need it. Then they also have this thing called Deck O Dice, which is exactly how it sounds. It's a deck, replace your dice. There's 24 cards, and instead of rolling a dice, you flip a card, and you see what the result would have been if it was a d4, d6, d12, etc. And this is kind of neat, but if you're only rolling one dice at a time, because if you're not, then the probability is skewed on the next card if you don't take the time to shuffle the whole deck and flip it up again, which feels like it would be a little, a little bit more involved than just, just rolling a dice. But if you don't have a dice, and you don't have a dice app, and you want to print out 24 cards of dice so that you can flip them over, I don't know, it, it, it seems ludicrous to me, and yet I'm still interested in this thing. I think it still looks cool, even though I know that using it doesn't make any sense at all. If you're ever at a loss for dice, this is a pretty decent way to use this concept, I guess. And finally, the last one is a Duel for Dragons, which is a card game, a dueling card game, where you draw from the same deck. Might as well be mind bug without the bugs. You're not gonna print it anyway. Let's just wrap this segment up. <laughs> Anyway, if you are interested in all of those, hey, now you know about them. That's Friday at 10 p.m. Check it out. Now, next up, we have Weather Machine. We have made it to the most hyped game on this list. I mean, I guess there's a there's a more hyped one down the lines with Borderlands, but I've already made a video on that. So the most hyped for me, I guess, by famed designer from On Mars, The Gallerist, and Lisboa. Speaking of Lisboa, I've got one episode of Money Heist left. It's slowly returning to its great form. I'm very hopeful for the ending. If you haven't seen it, go check it out on Netflix. Such a good show. Parts 1 and 2 are exceptional. And then after that, it's like, yeah, I I'm hanging around because I enjoyed Parts 1 and 2 so much. And this is fun to just, you know, exist in for a little bit. But we're not here to talk about pop culture. We're here to answer the age-old question. Do you know what happens when Vital Lacerda gets hit by lightning? It's not the same thing that happens to everything else. His name gets flipped backward and he becomes the eccentric weather Professor Lativ. So Professor Lativ is constantly messing with the weather and it's up to you to run around fixing his mistakes over and over and over again. And if you fix the most mistakes, hey, you get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> what a surprise, a Nobel Prize for fixing all the climate mistakes made by an old white guy. We can only dream. I mean, really, it's probably worth purchasing just to get that bomb Latif meeple, after all. With his little top hat? Yeah, Latif maybe spend a little less time showboating and a little bit more time fixing the weather. We wouldn't be in this mess, would we? <sighs> but it's a pretty decent Kickstarter video, in a sense that it tells you all the different steps you're gonna do in the game while not necessarily explaining the game whatsoever. This must be like how all hands-on learners feel when I'm just shouting rules, explanations at them. And here, you're gonna go to the government and you're going to get a grant from them or sell them things or take things from them. Okay. <laughs> but thankfully, the draft rule book is also really well done if you want to read through and get a sense. Basically, there's going to be, basically, you can't really basically anything about this game. There are so many moving parts. You're going to be creating your own little laboratory on the side that can house additional things. That'll be act as like your personal supply and you're gonna be taking these little laboratory tokens and creating a little puzzle on one side while managing your uh, automation bots that are going out to various places to do the dangerous weather work that humans can't accomplish while also managing your supply chains and getting vouchers for certain things while also researching different flaws in the weather while also trying to maintain the weather mistakes that Latif has created that are constantly springing up while also selling things to the government while also researching your own little breakthroughs and then also using other people's research breakthroughs as well, but you can't use your own. As long as you quote your sources, it's okay. It's not plagiarism, something a few people on YouTube could learn about, while also conducting enough research to put into those papers so that you can build those prototypes to fix different parts of the weather and eventually win the Nobel Prize. Easy peasy. But the best part, my favorite tiny little rule <laughs> that I found was if Latif is in his office, players earn income at the beginning of the round. 
But if he isn't, <laughs> they don't. Which I think is very funny that of course this is this way. This idiot professor running around the team. He won't even pay you because he's too busy screwing up the weather and ruining the planet unless he's right at his desk and you can catch him and say, give me my money. He won't pay you, which I think is just, is just incredible. And that is a reason you should get it. But some reasons you may not be interested in it is that obviously, maybe judging by my slight explanation, we'll call it an explanation. I'm, I know it wasn't. <laughs> it's too big a game to distill in this sort of explanation. It's not really that accessible. Leave it to David Turksey to be involved in something so complicated, even the player aid has to be eight pages long. So if accessibility is a requirement for you, definitely walk away. If you've never played a Vital Lacerda game before, I also don't know if this necessarily has to be your first one. There are a ton of other options out there. You can go to a board game cafe, you can borrow it from a friend, you can get one of his existing games probably for cheaper. I say probably because they're, they're not always popping up secondhand. I don't see that many copies. I've, I've seen The Gallerist a few times now. And The Gallerist is actually the only Lacerda game that I've played. Matt, who you may remember from my Top 5 Cottage Games video, he owns The Gallerist. I've played it with him. I've only played it once. And I remember enjoying it. I remember thinking, oh yeah, this is fun. Like, definitely was a fun time. I mean, it didn't, uh, it didn't make me want to take my clothes off and run around screaming. I wasn't that excited. <laughs> but like, it was fun. I just think that these collaborations with Eagle Griffin Games are so expensive. They really are. Even with the discount that you're getting off the MSRP, you're really making up for it in the shipping, at least for here in Canada. It's being offered for $125 US, but I'd still have to pay about $30 US for it to get here anyway, and MSRP is usually quoted at $165 US. Now, to be fair to Eagle Griffin Games or to your wallet, they make a real point. They're kind of like Nintendo in the sense that they really try to make sure their games never go on sale or go under that MSRP price. So if you are backing now and you can get it cheaper with the shipping, then it might be worthwhile getting because I do think that it will be a, a comparable price later on or close to it. Like you won't, you won't ever get burned by seeing it significantly cheaper down the line. But that being said, it is really expensive for a big old Euro game. Maybe you love Euro games. Maybe you love Lacerda games. If you do love Lacerda games, how many times have you played all of your other Lacerda games? Because I've played the Gallerist once. I know Matt's had it for a long time and it certainly hasn't overstayed its welcome. Let's put it that way. And in terms of the stretch goals, to me they seem of very minimal importance. Don't get me wrong, they will add some value. I really like that they're giving you cards that have variable startup setup rather than the same setup across the board for everyone, kind of like Terraforming Mars Prelude. I don't know, it's, uh, it's not like they're giving you a whole extra box full of stuff for the same price that you would pay at retail. It's a bunch of promo cards, which you'll have to ask yourself if that makes it more valuable to you or not. I know the completionist in you wants it and thinks the game will be garbage without it, but spoiler alert, it won't be. <laughs> On the flip side, you can buy other Lacerda and Eagle Griffin game collaborations through this Kickstarter as well. And you can get the Kickstarter version too. So if that is important to you, they're being offered for, I compared it with my local game store, about the same price that those games are currently on offer at my store. I looked at Board Game Bliss to compare because they ship more internationally than 401 games. Those are kind of my go-to points in Toronto. They're about a similar price point. So if you wanted to get yourself the whole Lacerda collection and spend over a thousand dollars, hey, I hope you love them and I hope you get them to the table all the time, but you certainly don't need them. So yeah, that was kind of five reasons, right? <laughs> I know it was. <laughs> Not necessarily that accessible. Minimal stretch goal importance. You can get another one of his games for cheaper. If you've never played a Lacerda game before, try it out before you spend so much money. And it's a lot of money for a Euro game. Make sure you really like that genre. But it is looking like it is gonna hit a million dollars. It's so close, so. There's something about the big box of Lacerda that also really appeals to me because I love those inner workings of stuff. So check it out if you want. That finishes this Saturday, December 18th at 10 a.m. 
Now next up, you've heard of 8 Minute Empire, which is still on the shelf from my Purge video and has not yet been played. But have you heard of 9 Minute Nation? Nope, 9 Minute Kingdom? They decided to opt for the non-alliteration there, so you would know that it is a serious game for serious people. With only 9 cards, 9 dice, and not 9 minutes? No, that's... That's something else. But it's a very simple drafting game here. You have 10 cards, you're gonna pick one, lay it down in your kingdom, pass the cards along, get the cards from your neighbor, pick another one, lay it in your kingdom, King Domino style or Carcassonne style, making sure that the parts of your kingdom that have colors match up with each other and the picture all makes sense. And then at the end of the game, you're gonna score points for the amount of icons in one color that has been created together. And also there are going to be these edicts that are out there. One which will be to the longest road because it's not all about the colors. There's also little roads that you're trying to connect as well and creating this big kingdom. And then the other will be the person who has the most temples in their place or the most red spaces in their field. And whoever has the most points wins. This feels like very King Domino but almost better because it's cards and you don't have to spend the time shuffling the dominoes. I like the dominoes, it's just harder to mix up and play again over and over. So to have it in a card sort of setting, in a simple drafting thing, it finishes in nine minutes, it seems pretty cool. They also have a bunch of little mini expansions that will enrich the game. I also love they have this thing on their Kickstarter to say, to keep things simple, your Kickstarter will be far richer than anything you get in retail with four extra cards. <laughs> far richer. But it's nine euros or $13 Canadian for this small little game. And shipping is pretty reasonable as well. This is the price point that I want to see from these small card games. That's a great price. All in shipping should be around that $20 mark. And if it is, this is something that seems really simple and yet I think is going to play pretty well. I don't know, I hope I conveyed enough about the game. Definitely check this one out, I think. This is almost the reason I do these videos, to find these smaller games that are a good price point and feel like the mechanics, there's something interesting and solid there. Plus you can bang it out in nine minutes. I don't know, I'm excited about this one. So check it out, that's Saturday at 2.10 p.m. And you can buy one weather machine or like 16 of these. <laughs> now next up we have a two for campaign with two little trick taking card games called American Bookshop and Cinderella's Dance. And I just love the story on the American Bookshop campaign page. The story behind the game, there's a quote and it says, when I was working at a bookstore in America, there was an unhappy manager who took my precious playing cards. I was a little bit upset and it inspired me to make this game. <laughs> A game that he couldn't find out about. A game using books. <laughs> that's what we call the American Bookshop. I just think, I just think that's so funny. <laughs> you take my cards? Fine. I'll use books as cards. What do you think about that, huh? <laughs> so in American Bookshop, it's a standard trick-taking game in which the highest card of the suit led wins. But the trick <laughs> is that if the total value of the cards exceeds a certain number with four players, it's up to 16, whoever plays the last card wins it all. So you can play those big value cards at the start, but you're not necessarily going to win it because someone could just bust it and take all the cards themselves. But there's another layer to it as well, because it's only the person who has the most cards of a sp specific suit specific book type, will get one point for each of those cards. And everybody else will lose one point for each of those cards if they don't have the most. And if you're tied, everybody loses. This seems really cool. Two really neat twists on the trick-taking genre. Somebody mentioned this in the comments last week, and you are absolutely right. This looks cool. Now for Cinderella's dance, they also say you must anticipate each other's movements. Like you're dancing. That's how it ties in with the title. Sure. There are 21 cards, one to 21, and you can play any cards you want, and the other person has to play a card that is one to three above it. So you only get a certain number of cards in your hand, the rest you don't use for the game. So it's about figuring out what cards your opponent has, timing out when you use those cards. The last person to play a card gets to take all the cards, and the person with the most cards at the end wins. It's only a two-player game, whereas American Bookshop is for more people. This one I'm, eh. I'm a little less enthusiastic about. I just think American Bookshop, the, the mechanisms behind that feel really interesting. And this one, I just go, ah, I'm, it's probably interesting in practice, but I don't, I don't see it as vividly 
as I would. And you could do this just with any, with 21 pieces of paper, really, or a regular set of cards. Or you have the mind, play it with the mind, right? You don't really need a designated deck for this game, whereas I think American Bookshop, there are some certain distributions where you might want that specific deck. Now, Cinderella's Dance is 18 Canadian, 14 US, 12.5 euros, or American Bookshop is 27 Canadian, 21 US, 18.75 euros. You gotta pay more for the better one. That's just how it is. Unfortunately, they say on their campaign page, shipping is 1,500 yen, and Cinderella's Dance is 1,550 yen. So it's almost double if you're getting Cinderella's Dance, or like $18 in shipping for me if I'm getting American Bookshop, which makes it a little bit too pricey for what it is, just a, a simple deck of card game. But they both definitely look interesting. So if you are interested, that is Sunday at 11 a.m. Now, next up, we have Snack Time. Snack Time! Well, that's my monster voice, I guess. Well, it's really, really Jason Schwartzman's uh, monster voice that I stole. But anyway, their catchphrase is a gruesome roll and write for an unlimited amount of players. Don't get caught by the police while making sure your cr little creature friends don't starve. So you have a bunch of creatures in the sewer who just need themselves a little snack. So of course they're finding delicious idiot pedestrians up there that are just walking by oblivious to the world. And sure, you could stop them, but then you'd probably get eaten instead and surely did cut you off in traffic this morning so seems like she made her choice oh greg i know where you can find some ice cream <laughs> poor greg he didn't even make it through this video <laughs> each turn you're going to roll dice which will add segments of pipe to your map that you're going to use to lead to five various exits where unsuspecting pedestrians are waiting to be eaten. And you're also going to use these other dice to add parts to your monster to make sure that he has enough tentacles or eyes needed to consume the pedestrian walking by. Like the little baby yum yum that he is. <sighs> My friend Josh named his humidifier little baby yum yum and now asks Google to turn on little baby yum yum every time he walks into his house. And it, it makes me angrier than anyone has ever been in recorded history. But it's a pretty simple game. You get seven dice, 35 cards of pedestrians, and 100 pages of a notebook. So you get 100, look at all those components. 100 pages, wow, <laughs> what a deal. It's $25 US, $32 Canadian. This one seems solid. I think drawing the little pipe will feel fun. Right, it's just up to you if you like roll and rights. I think you'll be interested. I tend to like roll and rights that can't be played by an unlimited amount of people because I find there's more interaction with unlimited people. It's just basing your decisions off the dice and you might as well be playing solitaire. But if you like roll and rights, check it out. That's Sunday at 12 p.m. AKA noon. A few more. Up next we have Speed Paper. And of course we couldn't end the year of crowdfunding countdown if there wasn't a Rallyman Cars game. And there isn't. Of course, that was, it's called Rallyman. But this one is a racing game, which I always will associate with Rallyman cars, but it's a print and play. So for the price of one Rallyman car, you can get yourself an entire game, the print and play of Speed Paper, the officially not licensed version of the critically reviewed movie, Speed Racer. And let me tell you, this game is so dumb, but it is a great idea. You make your little paper cars, you have a little map, and you flick them along the track. But you can't flick them off the track because then you'll get a penalty for going outside the on the grass, and you can't flick them into other people's cars because you're not a maniac. You're just having a nice race here. You're not Sebulba in Pod Racer. And whenever you want to turn, you can pick up your little car and turn them because you can only flick the back of the car. It requires you to use some of your tire wear. So you you have to be economical about when you turn your little paper, how far you flick it. I don't know. It's just an easy little dexterity game, but it's a print and play for something like $4 or $6. And if that sounds interesting to you, it almost makes me change my stance on print and plays completely. <laughs> Check that one out. That's Tuesday the 21st at 9.53 a.m. Now, next up we have Octopus Garden, and I am so happy to be talking about this one because hopefully it means I'll never have to think about it again because every time I think of the title of this board game, I get the Beatles song stuck in my head, and it's going right now. I'd like to be, you know that one, under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade. I think it's in the shade, and that's literally all I know of the song. That's it. I don't know any other lyrics. Ugh. <laughs> and it's been stuck in my head for weeks. Every time I see a video pop up about 
about Octopus Garden because I see them on YouTube sometimes. Get out of here. <laughs> anyway, it's a little tile laying game. You're gonna get pearls from your oysters, so don't slurp them down just yet because they give you pearls each round. And then you can buy a row or a column from a three by three market. And these are going to be pieces of the garden that you're going to get to decorate and use to attract fish. And when somebody's garden is completely finished, the game is over, you add up your points, you see who wins, you get points beauty points for what you have in your garden. If you found any little Nemos in your anemones, or if there are any secret little relics in your garden, that sort of thing, just, just points for a bunch of stuff. It's 30 bucks US, or $39 Canadian, and it's on Tabletopia, so you can try it out. A lot of these have been on Tabletopia as well. And I said I was gonna highlight that every time, and then I never did. Ah, <sighs> bad little baby yum yum. And I hate, I hate that it's catchy too. It's not catchy, but I hate that it gets caught in my head more than the Octopus Garden song. But anyway, I like that it's on Tabletopia. I like that you can try it out, see if you like it more than any other tile laying games. Because after shipping, you're still gonna be paying like 42 bucks US to $50, which isn't, isn't bad, but for something like this, like a Carcassonne-esque thing that you would hope to pay around the $30 mark in the store, maybe that's too much for you. But it seems, it's, you know, it seems pretty solid. I like the pick three mechanic. I think that's the most kind of standout mechanic to me about this one. And it makes it feel a little bit more friendly too, because you can disrupt someone's perfect row, but they still will be able to get those two things that they want. Unless of course they take your exact perfect row and ruin your plan completely, Greg. Hey, <laughs> you didn't get it eaten by the monster. Greg's back. There's no ice cream under the sea, Greg. <laughs> and he's gone again. <laughs> anyway, if you're interested in that, that's Tuesday at 10.55 a.m. And we just have two more, a couple more. This is where the other crowdfunding countdown would have ended anyway. So there really aren't many more in the coming weeks. That's why I'm throwing them in here now. That is a big week though. This has been a pretty long episode. <laughs> But of course we do have Borderlands, which is finishing on the 23rd at 2 p.m. And I already talked about Borderlands in my five reasons you shouldn't back. I went into great detail about why I'm interested in it, why I'm not. There just are a couple updates. I love as soon as I finished filming it, they added, hey, if you want us to print out all the campaigns for you, and print out all of the scenarios, well, it's gonna cost you an extra $10 for this rule book. Of course, of course it would. Of course, in a campaign where they're charging you $30 for these extra six little miniature objective things that really don't do anything. Well, yeah, why wouldn't they charge you $10 to print out the rule book? If I was planning on backing it, that $10 rule book would have put me over the edge. But I think the gameplay does look fun, that being said, so. Make your choice. I just wanted to throw in that little update about that dumb, expensive campaign book that they'll print for you for the low, low price of $10. It's only like 48 pages. I could print that at a local print shop. I don't know, five bucks? Just staple it together? Call it bad weather? No, that's Professor Lateef. It just, this, these sort of things just make me so mad. Like, that should have been a given. You know, that should be a stretch goal. That should be for all backers. I guess all backers don't need all the scenarios, except you're gonna wanna provide them all the scenarios so that they can continue to play and get value out of your game. And sure, Zombicide, they're releasing, and sure, something like Zombicide, they release scenarios afterwards, but it's because they're releasing supplementary material that they're online and that you can print them out or just look them up for the setup. I guess it saves on paper, hey. They're doing their best to combat Professor Latif's maniacal tinkering, so I guess we gotta give you give you props, Borderlands. Anyway, if you are interested in that, that finishes, remember, Thursday, 2 p.m. Next Thursday, next, next Thursday, December 23rd. And finally, and not a board game, we're talking about Kingmaker Tables, which for $890 US or around $1,130 Canadian, approximately how much it would cost you to buy all the Lacerda games. <laughs> I'm guessing, I haven't done that math yet, but I'm assuming I'm pretty close. You can get a six person table and a little side shelf to hold some games and the toppers that go on the table when you're, you're not playing the game and you turned it back into a a table. And their pictures are weird. It really looks like it isn't a recessed table, but if you watch the video, you can see that it, it's perfectly fine. And you'll also notice that it really showcases you can use the small little component holders to hold your cubes during a game. That's probably my favorite part of the video. It really seems like that's the only feature because they showcase it 
And this is true 1,174 times. Now keep in mind that these component holders, as is the case with all of these board game table things, they never come with the package price. They're gonna cost 15 to $20 each. And you're probably gonna to wanna to have six of them if you have a six person table, at least. Some combo of drink holders and maybe component holders because they're pretty handy. You see the cubes? And right now you'd have to decide if you wanna offer your guests wine or not because then you'd have to buy another six for the wine nights. But realistically, just get cup holders and everyone can drink their wine out of mugs the way the Vikings did it. It's thematic for, for the Viking games, I guess. It's game wine. They'll never know the difference. But realistically, those cup holders are the most important accessory to one of these gaming tables. They also have LED lights inside, which are pointed down at the mats. So they're not glaring into your eyes, which I think is a neat feature that they should have showcased more instead of the cubes. Oh, did meeples this time? Or the fact that they have like card slots around the entire playing area, which I think a lot of board game tables have that, but they also have it as well. Anyway, the reason I wanted to bring it up is as far as overpriced gaming tables go, I think this one actually is one of the best price points that I've seen. Like it's still way beyond my budget, but if you don't want the game topper, I mean, obviously you do, that's what? Did you see those cubes? <laughs> Whole point of having one of these things is that you can put the toppers on when you're not using it and keep the game underneath. It's only 650 bucks US, which for a sturdy wooden table, that's good. So if you've always wanted a table, check it out. This one might put you over the edge. I will point out that it seems like their video is four people sitting around a six person table. So it might be a bit cramped and especially check out the board. They're playing scythe at one point to give you a sense of the space as well. And really make sure you measure that out. Make sure it's gonna be big enough for your own space or not too big for your space as well. But the other main draw aside from the price is also the little side cabinet that it comes with. And I think this is a really smart idea. It's the first time I've seen that. It gives you an extra little shelf to come with your table. Perfect. And you don't have to worry about where do you put these game topper pieces when you're playing the game, just lying everywhere, scattered. That way the room always stays kind of in a nice order. And I think that's really, really clever. And I'm surprised that I haven't seen that sort of thing being offered in a campaign. And you get this other little shelf in the bundled price with the LED lights and the topper and all that sort of stuff. So. If you have been on the fence about getting a game table or you've been looking for a reasonably priced one or the cheaper side, this one seems a cool one. Again, like I said, it's not for me. I, I also don't have the space for it, but, but this is maybe because I've seen so many tables and I go, wow, $2,000, that's outrageous. And this is, you know, significantly less than that. Maybe that's why I'm, I'm more hyped on it, but check it out if you're interested. To end 2021, that is Friday, December 31st at 4 p.m. And that's it. <laughs> we made it. That's the end of the week. The end of the year. The end of crowdfunding countdown forever. Uh, no. So every week I do a pick for me and a pick for you. This week, it's tough, right? They're kind of similar to last week. There aren't a lot that are necessarily standing out to me. There are numerous reasons why I'm interested in Borderlands and Weather Machine, but there's reasons why I'm not interested. So I'm not going with those. I do have a pick for me, and this is one that I am really contemplating backing. I might do it, and I don't really back anything. This is a really nice surprise for me, and that's Nine Minute Kingdom. I don't have Sushi Go. I don't have many just pure drafting games. I like King Domino, but I don't pull it out that much. Maybe this will be the same thing, but since it's shorter, maybe it won't. A quick just drafting card game, I believe it plays in nine minutes, maybe even less, unless it takes you one minute to decide on every card you're gonna pick. I don't know, there's something about it that I think is really good and that price point is great. <laughs> I want to highlight that really solid, accessible price point, which after shipping would be around 20 or so bucks for me. And that, that feels good for this size of a game. That's what puts me off from a lot of these games that kind of feel the same. If this were 10 bucks cheaper, I'd be like, eh, whatever. It's, it's just kind of an average concept. But I think the concept is gonna be implemented really well. And I'm excited to take a look at it, yeah. Check that one out if you're looking for those smaller filler games. Might be a nice travel game too. Or it might get stale really quickly. I don't know. But I think the combinations, the possible combinations, I like that the edicts, you're going to be competing for different victory conditions each time. And there's 17 of those and you only see seven of them each time. So it feels like there's going to be enough replayability there 
And there also are ways to make bigger castles as well, bigger kingdoms for, for fewer people. So uh, yeah, Nine Minute Kingdom, that's my pick for me. That's my pick for you too. <laughs> my, I mean, my other pick of the week, I guess would be American Bookshop. I think that one also looks good. It's a little bit on the pricey side, so I'm not really considering it, but I'll make that the pick for you. Or again, just play something on your shelf. But I think these those two games, they're the ones that really stood out to me mechanically as being something special. Or I like the twists that they do. I like what they're offering. And I think if you like that kind of genre, that's probably a good pick. And if you don't, well, hey, watch Money Heist, I guess. <laughs> I've already brought it up once, so let's make that <laughs> the pick. I love heists. I love heist movies and heist shows. So if you've, re if you've been living under a rock, I don't know. It's very good. I'm excited to watch the last episode, maybe tonight, if I get done editing this video in time. So that's it. That's all. As always, what are you excited about? Is there anything that I missed? Is there anything in the upcoming weeks that I did miss? Because it's very possible looking ahead or things don't launch or people don't put or I just miss them. There's a lot of stuff out there that I, I try to distill down. So it's easy for a couple to slip through the cracks. So let me know what's, what you're excited about. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Chris George. I do not have a catchphrase, but I feel like I should, I feel like I should say something like, see you in the new year, but I, there's gonna be a, I have a lot of videos that I want, that I have to put out before the new year even happens. It's nice that I can do those maybe a little bit in advance and give myself a week off around Christmas. So, so happy holidays. I mean, I'll see you. I'll see you soon. <laughs>